Okay, we are at the magical hour and we can start. And I believe we start by Krishna asking us a question from the previous lecture. So please go ahead. Oh, you're muted right now. Uh, I don't know if Krishna is here now. Um, okay, if we don't find him, then let me start and he can ask his question later. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Oh, yes. Krishna says he's unable to unmute. Ah, this is interesting. Why, uh, yeah, why is that? Uh, ICTS uh, people just check that. There should be all participants. Yeah, uh, hi. Yeah. Hmm. hi. So, am I audible now? Uh, you are audible now. Yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to clarify that uh, the compactness of CPQ follows from sequential compactness plus second countability, right? And not limit That's... point compactness. No, sequential. Sequential. So in the lecture, I used limit point. Uh, I used a combination of limit point and sequential. But I, I realized that sequential is enough by itself and we don't need to discuss limit point uh, compactness at all. Okay. So just sequential compactness and second countability will suffice That's... to that's right. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So now today, uh, okay, good. So last time we did the Rai Chaudhary equations and I hope people have gone through that, uh, uh, as I call them, AKR equations. I hope people have gone through them and tried to get their sort of uh, meaning and, uh, and, and of course the details of the derivation. And today we'll immediately do an application of it, uh, which is the Hawking, as it's called, Hawking Singularity Theorem. So, um, in fact, Hawking basically took forward the idea of Rai Chaudhary, which is let's talk about the actual universe, talk about cosmology and try to um, understand what we can uh, say about the future relative to now or the past relative to now using Einstein's equations. Now, people who work in cosmology usually use the following homogeneous and isotropic space-time uh, this is considered sort of the starting point for cosmological discussions with the metric ds squared equals minus dt squared plus a of t squared dxi dxi. So both homogeneous and isotropic. So let's, uh, oh, sorry, is that? Can you hear the fan noise of my laptop? I can switch to earphones if it will help. Anyone? Uh, no. No, okay, good. Okay. Uh, so this and with A of T called the scale factor. And then the Hubble constant is basically defined as the time deriv derivative of A normalized by A itself. So it's the logarithmic rate of increase of the scale factor, increase or decrease depending on its sign. Now, uh, remember the philosophy of the Rai Chaudhary equation, which was we want to go beyond this somewhat uh, special assumption of homogeneity and isotropy. First, let me highlight which one is doing what in this equation. So isotropy, whoops, something bad. Uh, isotropy is basically this fact that the spatial metric is um, diagonal and all components are equal. And that means that the, uh, oops, I did something very bad here, wait. Excuse me. Yeah. So isotropy means that 
all directions are equal. That's the precise meaning of the term. And that will be so if the metric is proportional to delta ij, and that gives this contraction. But isotropy by itself would allow a coefficient, which would now be one function because we've made it proportional to delta ij, but that function would in principle depend on x and t. Now we add homogeneity, which is not directional, but point about points. It says no point is more special than any other point. Okay, And that means that under that, the scale factor can't depend on the spatial point. And so it can only depend on time. And so with one of them, we got rid of this non-diagonal nature of the metric. And with the other, we reduced uh, the last remaining component of the metric to be a function only of time. Now let's compare with the general case. The general case, uh, and actually I must say that this giving these lectures has been very illuminating for me to uh, realize what is an assumption of symmetry and what is just a choice of coordinate system. Uh, so for comparison, general case, a general metric, it's a general metric, but it's in special coordinate system, which is the one adapted to geodesics. And it's ds squared equals minus dt squared plus this. And this is what we discussed last time. So we see that uh, this implies that gij of xt, oh, this I should have said is called the Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric. So gij in FLRW is a of t squared delta ij. Now, what's the variable in which we wrote Raichaudhuri equations? It's basically that v equals debt to the half of g. And if we take debt of g, you see that for every direction i, we get one factor of a squared. When we take, to, take it to the half, we get one factor of a. So in the end, we get one factor of a for every spatial direction, d minus 1. So v, the v of last lecture is just a d minus 1 in FLR w. Okay. Interestingly, this means, and this finally, I believe, explains the uh, choice that G of Rai Chaudhary, remember it was the 1 over D minus 1th power of V. So it's actually equal to A of T. So the Rai Chaudhary quantity capital G is nothing but the one that in the FLRW case by assuming homogeneity and isotropy just reduces to the scale factor A. Now, of course, we could always use Raichaudhuri's equations applied to the FLRW universe, but I'm pretty sure that was studied before him. And that's exactly not what we want to do because we want to make general arguments about general space times. And we really don't want to restrict to a highly symmetric space-time like this one. So in, in the spirit that I explained last time, uh, and it, which is the spirit of Rai Chaudhary's paper, we exactly don't want to assume such very strong symmetries, however well motivated they might be physically on average. So with that, we are a little bit uh, in trouble to talk about the Hubble constant or Hubble factor, because the Hubble factor is defined with respect to the FLRW metric in terms of A. But now we have an ideal replacement. We have G of Rai Chaudhary in place of A. And only difference is that in general, G depends on both X and T. So this motivates us to define what is called a local Hubble factor. Precisely because the universe is no longer homogeneous by our assumption, 
we'll simply define the local Hubble factor to be H of X and T uh, to be G dot of X and T over G of X and T. I'm writing out this dependence is very explicitly just to make it very clear that we are not doing FLRW. And this is V dot of X and T divided by V of X and T, but normalized by one over D minus one. So the Raichaudhri parameterization is the one where this annoying factor one by D minus one is not there, while the other one is actually the, the one in terms of V is sort of um, standard in the literature. And uh, probably there's some good reason for it that doesn't come to my mind right away. Okay, well, I guess the point is that V is um, the root debt of G, which is, a, which is a nice quantity in GR because it defines volume elements. Okay, so now what can we say about this local Hubble uh, parameter uh, from Raichaudhri's equations? That's the goal. All clear so far, I hope? Okay. So we're going to do our usual, play our usual game. We're going to pick a Cauchy surface, sigma, and we're going to use this metric, the general metric. And now we're going to consider a point in the past. So if this is sigma, this is yeah, okay, and this whole thing is M. And here's my point P in the past of sigma. Okay. Now, last time we showed, and we don't need to even repeat it, that G dot over G. Um, is a so that G double dot is negative. And therefore, in particular, if you choose G dot over G positive on the Cauchy surface, then there'll be a focal point in the past. Okay, so let me write that uh, last time. Actually, we have done nothing compared to last time except give a name to G dot over G. G dot over G was already uh, the object of our calculations from last time. And we showed that if G dot over G is equal to, is greater, is equal to something like one, let me call it now one over H min. I'll explain why. So sorry, not one over H min, but H min. Sorry, G over G dot. I'm just reading my notes wrong. G over G dot is one over H min greater than zero, then there is a focal point in the past at A time T uh, of order actually greater than or order minus one by H min. Now that's not actually what we showed last time. What we showed is that if G over G dot is negative, then the focal point is in the future at a time before one over H min. But I mentioned that if we just flip the sign of time and take G over G dot positive now, and then go into the past, you will get a focal point at some time uh, by the time you reach minus one over H min to the past. Okay. Uh, yeah. Smith, a, a focal point hmm. uh, means that all the geodesics from the service Good. reach, Good. or Thank is you. it just any two? No, no, all, and that's very important. And I'm, I was about to say that. And it's very important to note that all uh, time like past directed geodesics 
Uh, there's also the word, I'm not going to keep writing it, but inextendable, because inextendable, if you remember, means that it doesn't end arbitrarily. It only ends because of the space time. And so I'm avoiding any geodesic, which I by hand decide to end somewhere, then obviously this isn't true. So all time like past directed geodesics reach a focal point. At, uh, at a time uh, by a time uh, t as I said order minus 1 by h min. Now let's be very clear what this means. First of all it's all but secondly we are not claiming that all of them focus to one point. So here's what the actual scenario we predicted from right of the equations looks like. Here's one geodesic. Uh, here's one geodesic. Here's another. They focus here. Here's another geodesic. It focuses here along with maybe 10 other geodesics. Here's another one. And it reaches a focal point there. But the time, this time, is 1 by h min. And by the time we reach this dotted line surface in the past of the Cauchy hypersurface sigma, every time like geodesic that was trying to come into the past has focused, has reached a focal point. Nowhere did we say that the focal point is the same for all any pair of geodesics. We don't know how many geodesics meet at the focal point. We're not saying that the focal points are all at the same time in the past. That's obvious because the right of the equation, remember, was a bound. The way we used it, it was a bound. There was an equation, but eventually we converted that to a bound. And once there's a bound, things can happen before we reach the bound. The only thing is they can't happen after we reach the bound. So there's literally no time like geodesic which does this. Neither it can go into the past beyond this dotted line, nor it can even it, with or without focusing in the past before that. It just can't do that. It can't either focus to another geodesic somewhere here, nor can it continue to infinity. Okay, it's already focused by that time. Okay. So, As, so the yes. volume element is going to zero by h min minus h min, right? Yeah, but at different points, yeah, but it's a volume, it's a time dependent volume, it's a space dependent volume element, excuse me, it depends on x. Okay, yeah, so, so entire sigma, I mean, uh, space like um, part of the manifold becomes a point. By... Yeah, but you know, yeah, that's right. But that's by the time you reach this dot. Right, right. It doesn't happen all at once. But hmm. by the time you're here, everything has contracted to a point. And uh, this is exactly now last time we, uh, so I'm removing this red line now because this is exactly not allowed. Uh, now last time we said, okay, this is what you can, can conclude, but who knows that it's just a feature of this coordinate system and it says we should not think about geodesic type of coordinates, okay? But now we add one little additional uh, result, which creates a theorem. And this is a result is basically what you might consider a starting assumption of Hawking, which is that not only uh, Rai Chaudhary's equations hold, which he assumed and duly credited, but he also assumed the space-time is globally hyperbolic. And as I told you last time, there's no mention of this concept in uh, Rai Chaudhary. And it's actually, this concept is, uh, was essentially developed at or after Rai Chaudhary's paper. I mean, the real tragedy in my mind is that he wrote only that one paper, as far as I know. Uh, I don't know, maybe if he wrote one or two more, but he basically did not develop the subject. But had he developed the subject and had he been able to be in the company of other interested people, uh, he probably would have landed on many of these things. Okay, so 
Hawking assume globally hyperbolic M and then AKR equations. Now it seems very innocuous because we have sort of behaved as if globally hyperbolic M is the only thing any sensible person would think of. But the problem is that exactly this diagram contradicts global hyperbolicity because it means that if there's a point here, P, then it has no future directed time like geodesic that passes uh, through sigma just by reversing the direction. If there was, then there would have been a geodesic from sigma coming through P, but we just argued that they all focus before you reach there. Okay, so between these two, we have a contradiction. And this contradiction means that it's no longer a case of something being wrong with the coordinate system in which we are discussing this, the space time, but there's something must be wrong with the space time itself. Okay, and literally, as you can see now with no work, I have stated in an oversimplified way, Hawking singularity theorem. This is the theorem and uh, the statement then is that uh, if one and two above are true, so one and two, I guess uh, the, the correct statement is one and two are contradictory. because a uh, AKR equation implies no time like geodesics from sigma to the past reach beyond T equals minus one by H min. And this implies that by reversing that time like geodesic that you can't have, can't be global, globally hyperbolic. Now, uh, even before you ask any questions, let me emphasize two things. One is, that okay so the first let me say what hawking concluded uh, there must be a singularity of space time in the past and this is the words this is the sort of language used by hawking and also Penrose. Okay, the word singularity. Now, a more modern approach to this uh, would limit the statement to uh, that the space time is geodesically incomplete. incomplete okay so it's really that uh, a past directed time like geodesic must end instead of going on and this is uh, basically the statement of geodesic incompleteness i don't believe that hawking or penrose would disagree that this is what they showed uh, but the interpretation, whether geodesically incomplete, which is a very precise uh, mathematical and physical statement about space time, whether this is exactly saying that there's a singularity is a bit uh, less clear. And one of the reasons in modern times is that 
if we approach this place where the singularity allegedly lies, we might realize that we are actually crossing the bounds of validity of Einstein's equations themselves on which everything has been based for two interesting reasons. I'm, this isn't in my notes, but I may put it in or I may not. Uh, but let me just, yeah, let me not even write anything. I'll just say it. The two reasons are one that Einstein's uh, equations can have higher derivative corrections. So if there's any strong curvature, then those will contribute. And today we have no way to rule out that there are such corrections. Uh, all we know is that there's a bound on them coming from the strongest curvature that we can experimentally, uh, that we have experimentally detected. Okay, so the point is that higher derivative corrections to Einstein's equations are um, uh, irrelevant for slowly varying fields. But if, if the fields vary a lot, which is exactly when there's a high curvature, then they may be relevant. So we don't know. The second thing, of course, is that we don't know whether quantum theory might be the important thing over there, quantum gravity. And we're not really sure how to study this problem in quantum gravity. So there are various reasons. These are not, you know, anything watertight, but there are arguments saying that when this is true, you should not generically rush to say that there's a singularity. So I hope I made that point clear. Uh, thinking about it now, I actually will put it in my notes somewhere uh, saying that this is uh, how we would like to think. Okay. So the assumption of Raichaudhuri equations yeah. that something is I think it was less than zero. So uh, that is related to the fact that the universe is expanding. Uh, yeah, uh, no, no, I don't think, no. I mean, if the universe is expanding, this is the case, right? G over G dot is, is greater, uh, than zero. greater than zero. Okay. Yeah. Now there's a, you might get confused if you look at Witten's notes because he actually changes the sign of the T parameter so that it goes in the past. What I've okay. done is that my T parameter goes in the future. And all I did was to note that uh, with this condition on the Cauchy surface, if you evolve to the past, you find this. Yeah. Now, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, are there any questions about these statements so far? Okay, now two things I want to emphasize. First, uh, this discussion makes uh, Hawking's theorem look like a trivial consequence of Raichaudhuri's equation. Okay, and that I think is very uh, unfair. It's of course essential, essentially it comes from Raichaudhuri's equation, but global hyperbolicity is the other important factor. And this, sort of came about in various to various degrees in the decade from Raichaudhuri's submission in 53 to Hawking's papers, which are in the mid 60s, okay? And it was then that it became realized and was stated by Hawking uh, that uh, focal points uh, can help us to predict uh, singularities in space time. Okay. Also, uh, much of the discussion that we uh, had in the uh, lectures, not last one, but two or three lectures back, if you remember, about the fact that uh, what happens if I take a geodesic uh, reaching a focal point, then I can deform it to another nearby one and smooth the kink and get a shorter length and so on, or longer, longer proper time. All that is part of actually this Hawking and Penrose's study of geodesics. So that sophistication of understanding focal points. So Raichaudhuri actually has no mention of the word focal point, though he does talk about whether G can, capital G can go to zero in the past, which is exactly what we are saying in this diagram and which is exactly due to focal points, but uh, that wasn't developed. So I think to be fair, Hawking and Penrose did quite a lot. In fact, it was Penrose and then Hawking, and then Hawking and Penrose together. So there were several papers. Uh, so they developed the entire concept. Maybe I'm. Maybe there were others, and I'm 
of conjugate points as they called it. And conjugate points uh, to the extent I can understand, so this is discussed in Wall's book, which is basically equivalent roughly to focal points. Uh, my feeling is that uh, if you remember when we talked about focal points, we mentioned that they need not be, it's not only at focal points, but sometimes you can switch to an approximate geodesic uh, at some point, and if that thing approximately solves the geodesic equation. Well, I think all of that is contained in the definition of conjugate points. Hmm. So there's a precise notion of conjugate points, which plays the role of focal points uh, in, in this discussion. Okay. And so this is one thing, one observation, which is important. And so <clears throat> in a way, uh, I following Witten uh, and to a lesser extent, Wald, have reversed the order of history. So first there was... Um, um, right, Chaudhary, well, first there was the study of symmetric space times like FLRW, then there was Right Chaudhary equation, and then there was Penrose and Hawking developing global, global hyperbolicity as well as uh, conjugate points, focal points, and so on. And it's only when you put all this stuff together that you get a singularity theorem. Now, there's a second uh, objection to the above which is very obvious and I thought I would be asked immediately, maybe globally hyperbolic is a bad condition. This just says, this just could say that, well, we don't require, we shouldn't require global hyperbolicity. We got in all this trouble um, with uh, singularity or geodesic incompleteness by combining that with right Chaudhary. Nobody is objecting to right Chaudhary's equations, but why are you adding global hyperbolicity? So for that, you know, we had this uh, quite a long uh, discussion that it's a good, um, it's a good uh, condition for predictability of the future from a given initial value surface and uh, various other good uh, features of it, which were already discussed. Okay. But Hawking has an answer to this question also. And this is interesting. And let me just briefly mention it, but I have put it uh, in my notes in a little more detail. Actually, I should go into a little bit of detail. So supposing we relax it, let's relax global hypervelocity. What was it really doing for us? Well, many things, but one of the things it was doing, just one thing it was doing for us was to abolish closed time-like curves. So if we abandon global hyperbolicity, then we will get back closed time-like curves and we won't like it at all. But there are weaker conditions than global hyperbolicity, which also abolish closed time-like curves. One of the simplest is to just say that there are no closed time-like curves. Okay, In that case, you are abolishing, you are saying we only consider space-times. Uh, Sanket, we did not use the FLRW metric. I really want to, I can't emphasize this strongly enough. In today's lecture, whatever I've said has, does not use the FLRW metric. Please, please go back over the lecture notes carefully. Hmm? There, there's no question of getting different results. Our calculations today, as they were last time, are completely general for general space time. The only thing is we have put some general conditions on the space time, but no symmetric conditions. Okay. So back to where I was, we could just assume that there are no closed time like curves. But uh, a topologist would object to that saying, well, in a topological sense, supposing there are, so closed time like curve looks like this. So this is future, 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 and I'm back here. Hmm? Everything is future directed and causal. 
and I'm back here. Okay, if you, it's difficult to, it's difficult to explain uh, how this is possible, but you can make examples where this is possible that you simply keep following a future directed path and you come causal path and come back to itself. Now, topologist would say that, well, supposing I'm able to come back, not to, oh God, my software doesn't like topology. Okay. Supposing I'm able to come back to a point that's not exactly my original point P. So you can't call this second path closed. Okay. But supposing topologically, it's inside any neighborhood of P, even if, even a very small neighborhood of P. Okay. Then topologically, it's though it's technically not closed in the sense that X of T is equal to X of zero, but it's as bad as being closed. Moreover, uh, a physicist would say, well, it's not closed such a path only in my metric, but let me, supposing there's a perturbation which deforms the metric by a very tiny amount, then poof, this thing will just close. So it's equally bad. So you want to abolish both this, uh, excuse me, you want to abolish both that and that. Okay. Now a condition which does that goes by the name of strong causality. I avoided introducing it till now because I wasn't completely sure where we would be using it. But now I'm real, I realize that this is where we are going to use it because we got a singularity theorem assuming global hyperbolicity. And we want to know if we'll still get a uh, singularity theorem assuming uh, strong causality. So let's define strong causality. Before that, just let me go back to something I maybe didn't emphasize enough. Uh, these two conditions that Hawking found contradictory include a subcondition. Remember that AKR equation, actually I really should call it AKR bound because it's the bound obtained from his equation. This only holds with the strong uh, energy condition, which is T, uh, which assumes T hat zero, zero is greater than or equal to zero. That was an input. So you can relax a lot of things to get around Hawking singularity theorem. You can relax either global hyperbolicity, which we are about to discuss, or you could, of course, relax the, uh, this is not infinity, this zero, zero we could relax the strong energy condition. And there's just enormous amount of discussion on these all these various possibilities. But I would like to focus on relaxing the global hyperbolicity condition uh, to strong causality. As we'll see, it actually doesn't help us evade Hawking's theorem, but it's worth a shot because it might help us until we can see why it doesn't. Okay, this is a good point to pause for questions. Then I'll define what is strongly causal and tell you what's the statement of Hawking's theorem in that case. Any questions? Um, I, uh, I, uh, I did not understand the second uh, case you wanted to abolish. Ah, okay. So I'm going to define it now. The okay. second case is basically in words, it is nearly closed. time like curves. But nearly is not a good mathematical word. And now when we define strong causality, we are exactly going to uh, make give a precise meaning to nearly closed. Okay, but you understand the motivation is to ban not just uh, closed time like curves, uh, like this one. But also nearly closed ones. I, I was just thinking, uh, mm -hmm. if we were, we are in an expanding universe right now. Yes. And somehow that P hat zero, zero greater than equal to zero mm -hmm. led to a particular sign of the determinant of GIJ. Actually, that's not, that's, that's too fast. It actually led to a bound. If the sign is the other way, yeah. there's no bound. Yeah, but that not is also that an opposite. To... It's not that we get an opposite prediction that the focal point goes to the other side. We just don't get any bound. Um, okay. Uh, 
D0 is just one contribution to the RHS of Rai Chaudhary equations. Yeah, uh, but for uh, D0, you know, we know that, you know, uh, for uh, positive cosmological constant, it's negative. So wouldn't it be like, making more sense to use in that condition before we talk about uh, this, uh, the global hyperbolicity? Well, as I said, you have to examine all possible conditions. I mean, uh, I'm going to talk about global hyperbolicity now. That has to be talked about. And the other thing also should be talked about, but I'm not going to do that maybe today. Uh, as far as what makes more sense, I mean, there's a huge literature and I'm really only able to summarize a certain part of it. Um, but as I said, one thing I want to really again emphasize is that if you assume T hat is less than zero, okay, there, by the way, there's strong energy condition, weak energy condition, null energy condition. I haven't even gone through all of those and I will be doing that. But supposing you just abolish uh, T hat, uh, just abolish this one uh, right now, then you have a right Chaudhary equation with the right hand side and there's nothing more you can do with it. So if you like, uh, if we want to be, uh, if we want to examine that possibility, we've just done it. T hat not greater than zero, no bound, discussion over. What, what more discussion can you have when there's nothing you can say? But then, not uh, sorry? But then uh, how do you like show that singularity still develops for a positive cosmological constant universe? I mean, we DC can't, we don't. It's not obvious that it does. Even the experimental fact, which we believe today, but provisionally, that there is a possible uh, positive cosmological constant was not known at Hawking's time. So this is the point. I mean, cosmology is not completely established. There is some favorite uh, model of cosmology. I'm not, I'm not equipped to teach that to you or even to talk about it probably. But um, um, I'm just telling you mathematically what GR predicts via right Chaudhary equations uh, under the assumption of T hat being positive, strong energy condition. But we'll revisit the strong energy condition in some detail and see what more we can say about it. As I said, there are several other energy conditions and there are uh, also questions about which one we should believe and which in classical theory and also which one we should believe in quantum theory. Now, this uh, particular short course of lectures is not going to venture into quantum gravity, even as a kind of conceptual thing. But Witten certainly does venture into that in his uh, in his course of lectures, uh, which I've given you the reference. And uh, then, uh, you know, there are things called average null energy condition. There are all kinds of things. And, uh, and, and it's a long discussion. So if we, to the extent possible, we'll have that discussion later. Okay. Now, what I've done in the notes, is to insert the definition of strong causality at the end of the section on globally hyperbolic space times. So you will have to go back when I post the notes and reference it from there. But since I didn't actually discuss it at that time, I think it will be good if I uh, do so now. And let me just uh, tell you, yeah. Okay. So here's the definition. Uh, a space time, oops, a space time. is strongly causal if for every point P and an arbitrary neighborhood O, uh, of P, there exists, and this is this is where it gets a little subtle, a sufficiently small sub neighborhood V, which is a subset of O, okay, but contains P, so it's like this. 
maybe I should write it. Sorry. V is not a good name. O prime in O, also containing P, that's built into the word neighborhood, through which no causal curve passes more than once. And that's illustrated right away with a diagram. So here's, let's read it out. A spacetime is strongly causal if for every point P and an arbitrary neighborhood O of P, open neighborhood, there exists a sufficiently small sub neighborhood. Not a common term, but I like to use it. O prime of O also containing P through which no causal curve passes more than once. So here's my space time. I start with my point P. Now, and I repeat for every P in principle. Now, somebody gives me a neighborhood O. What I'm what the theorem says is I should be able to find a sub neighborhood O prime of O, which also includes P and has the property that this doesn't happen. It's basically what I showed you earlier in the language of nearly closed curves, but now stated in the language of open sets of the topology, which makes it more rigorous. Okay, so why did we introduce this neighborhood O in the first place? Because you could imagine in a kind of multidimensional space and one with a complicated geometry and topology that some uh, unpleasant person gives you an O, which is large, but which is weirdly angled. Okay, so it somehow contains P in a very weird way. And whenever they give you that O, you should be able to find an O prime inside it and say, well, at least inside O prime, no uh, causal curve coming out of P comes back in. Okay. And then repeat for every P and also for every neighborhood that somebody might give you, you should be able to find that sub neighborhood. Okay. So O prime has to be properly contained in O. It has to properly contain P and it has to be such that what I've just drawn doesn't happen. Okay, this is a strongly causal space time. And it's a theorem, uh, which I'm not going to try and prove that globally hyperbolic implies, you can try to prove it and it looks to me that it's basically straightforward, strongly causal. So it's stronger. Okay, because if this O prime doesn't exist in some case, then you should be able to show that there are that the space time doesn't have a Cauchy surface. That means that some geodesic intersects that Cauchy surface. That what you would like to be a Cauchy surface gets intersected more than once, or that it's not acronal. Okay, for example, what you could probably do is pick the point P to be on your Cauchy surface, and then uh, if strong causality doesn't hold, then you would be able to uh, prove that the Cauchy surface is not acronal. Okay, so therefore, this implies strongly causal. However, strongly causal does not imply globally hyperbolic. So it's a stronger condition. And so it makes sense to relax Hawking's singularity theorem by deleting globally hyperbolic and going down to the weaker condition, strongly causal. Okay. So what happens? Does the singularity theorem evaporate? That would sort of be nice in a way. A lot depends on what you consider nice. But in fact, it doesn't go away. That's sort of the fact. So, 
and this is walled uh, theorem 9.5.2, which is attributed to Hawking, and which says that the geodesic incompleteness still follows if we only assume strong causality, well, I don't remember, yeah, strong causality and right of the equations. And now you need one more assumption that sigma the Cauchy surface is compact. And this was not assumed before. Okay. And um, you should, you might be able to realize right away uh, how this assumption um, is relevant because last time I gave you an example of a kind of fake focusing where I took Minkowski space uh, and space time and put a Cauchy surface that was wiggly and we got lots of focal points here and there and as I pointed out it's just our choice of Cauchy surface and has nothing to do with real uh, any, any real problem of space time. So it would be very worrying if in Minkowski space this theorem about singularity was true. And the reason it's not is that in Minkowski space, sigma is not compact. Minkowski space time itself is not compact. And any initial value surface that you put in it, say t equals zero or even a wiggly version, is not compact. So that's a relief. And that means that this theorem doesn't apply there. Now, uh, Wald also points out, and this is. Uh, something I didn't yet find time to do. Exercise three of chapter 10, uh, chapter nine, is that uh, can even relax strong causality. That means you'll still get geodesic incompleteness even without strong causality. Uh, so he's given it as an exercise. I haven't done it. I'm assuming you haven't done it but I'll be very happy if one of you does do it. The theorem says, uh, the problem says, eliminate the hypothesis of strong causality as follows. Uh, no, I'm not going to read this out. Uh, but again, you basically get, uh, yeah, you basically get focusing even without that. Uh, but but uh, I think one needs to be very careful, and so I don't want to do this in a hurry. And so right now, I'm not going to make a reference to that further reduction. Uh, and even at this one, which is now on the slide, I'm not actually uh, proving for you. I'm simply stating it. Okay. So it looks like under quite reasonable assumptions and more importantly, under assumptions which we know how to question if needed. We know where to question them. Uh, geodesic incompleteness is a generic problem of life and uh, we need to live with it. Yeah. So Sambit, yes, because of this, because Minkowski doesn't have a compact Cauchy surface, we cannot derive any uh, geodesic incompleteness or as you might be calling it, time bound. Hmm. So then the theorem, the singularity theorem would be true for a more limited class of space times. And here I, I, I hope I, I have emphasized uh, enough that, you know, when you do physics, it's important not to stick with one assumption and make it your dogma. You have to take multiple different assumptions and come to conclusions for each assumption. That way, if later on, let's say, for example, some experiment in the future proves something about 
our universe, we'll be in a position to then, uh, you know, apply our theorems to that. So, so we what we've assumed now is first globally hyperbolic and uh, strong energy condition. And here it was easy to prove the theor our theorem because it's there's nothing much left to prove. I mean, there is rigor and you'll find it involved, but it's basically a simple contradiction between global hyperbolicity and the fact that every geodesic focuses. Ah, I forgot to say one more thing. Uh, in this case, uh, geodesic incompleteness doesn't mean that every geodesic stops, but at least one. It's a weaker incompleteness. At least one time like geodesic to the past is incomplete. So the, uh, the theorem in the absence of global hyperbolicity is not so incredibly strong. It doesn't tell you that every past directed geodesic focuses and so you can't go at all. Uh, it says that not uh, there is one at least that does that does that is incomplete. And so there's some direction in the past where you hit something, the singularity as they would call it. Arpit has a question. What is sigma for a non-GHS? What is GHS? Globally hyperbolic, I guess. Since there may not be a Cauchy surface. Ah, very good, very good. So let me, thank you, thank you. I probably didn't say that clearly. Uh, yeah, so, Instead of it calling it a Cauchy surface in this theorem, you call it a compact, edgeless, achronal, smooth, space-like hypersurface with some condition on, uh, uh, yeah, with the condition what he calls k less than zero, which I think is our condition that g over g dot is positive. Okay, so it, it's an achronal surface. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Okay. So that's the end of our discussion on Hawking singularity theorem. And again, uh, uh, I should say that it came after Penrose's uh, singularity theorem for black holes, which uh, has a different level of impact, if you like. Uh, and it's also a different level of difficulty. So I'm going to start on that now because uh, and we won't finish it now and if we are lucky we'll finish it next time i don't even guarantee that Sorry. but uh, yes question please yes uh, so in some places i have seen that uh, geodesically incompleteness of space time is defined by that there exist points which cannot be connected by geodesic but here we are saying that there are uh, there like my geodesic if i extend in the past it mm. will be no no no, no, see, supposing one geodesic runs out, mm -hmm. okay, then the points beyond that geodesic in the past cannot be reached by a geodesic. They can be reached by a causal path which goes around that point. Hmm? Let's, let's look at it. Here's sigma. Here's my point P where there is a particular geodesic like that which just bangs into P. Okay. So it can't be it can't be uh, extended. It's essentially the same as deleting the point P. Okay. Now, if I was here, the geodesic which would have taken me to sigma would pass through P. I'm I'm choosing this other point Q to be such that its geodesic uh, should have passed through P, but now it can't because the geodesic through P to sigma uh, is incomplete and can't be continued behind P. Now, you're wondering, I think, whether we can reach Q from here. And we can by a causal path, but this won't be a geodesic. Okay. So geodesics are essentially, there's this uniqueness in the geodesic. So if it's the same reason why if I delete a point from my space time, I can't reach future or past points by geodesics. Did, did that answer your question? Yes, sir, yes. Okay. Now, we. Uh, I think this was a very sensible thing Witten did in his approach 
to first dispose of time like geodesics because time like geodesics are relatively simple and one of the simple things that goes implicitly into many of our statements and theorems is that they maximize the proper time now the problem with null geodesics is that every null geodesic has zero proper time by definition. So there's nothing you can really maximize. Okay. By definition, because a null geodesic is every, if it's null, it means that the proper time along it in every infinitesimal bit is zero. Okay. And that means it's following what it's doing basically is in a, in a generic manifold, start at a point, propagate a tiny distance along the light cone at that point. Remember I told you the light cone is in the tangent space. Once you've done a tiny distance, you again start at a point below it on the manifold and make the tangent space and go another infinitesimal distance on that light cone. Now, this doesn't make a straight light cone the way it does for Minkowski, where you can do this once and for all, but it makes some path. So that path you should not imagine as a straight line path. Okay, straight in our uh, visualization. Okay, it's only that in Minkowski where it's literally mod x equals t and that's called the light cone. But that certainly you cannot do in a generic manifold which might have a complicated coordinate system. It might need to be covered with patches. It has a, in principle, a lot of curvature here and there. So a null geodesic in a generic manifold is a curvy thing, but at every instant it's null. Okay, and now we would like to compare different ones. Hmm? We want to ask questions about focusing. We want to ask questions about extendability or various other things. But the one thing that we were relying on, which was the ability to compare, you know, to short, remember we wanted to increase the proper time by smoothening at a focal point and all. But with null, everything's zero and we seem to be stuck. Okay. So in this situation, you have to create a different set of uh, a different type of analysis for null geodesics. Now, uh, for this, we are going to introduce the concept of promptness. Uh, and this terminology, at least, seems to be due to Witten, it's quite recent, because at least I tried everything I could, unless somebody here can tell me otherwise, uh, I couldn't find this use. I am guessing that this is exact, extracted as a crucial property from uh, earlier papers, because Penrose's theorem relies on it. So it must be expressed in some form, and I couldn't figure out right away what the words are for that. Or maybe the maybe the word prompt was used and I just don't know. But uh, anyway, we are going to follow Witten therefore quite closely and his notes uh, at this stage. Okay, so let's first give a definition and then explain how useful it is. Okay, a causal path. Now I'm not saying geodesic and I'm not saying null. Uh, but I am in a globally hyperbolic space-time. So whenever I don't say otherwise, I'll always fall back to globally hyperbolic. Is called prompt. If there is no other causal path, that reaches, okay, now I have a problem. You see P and Q are space-time points. Uh, so I have to say the spatial location your Q at an earlier time. So let's do this. Here's P, here's Q. It has to be in the causal future, obviously. And I have a causal path like that, reaching Q. Now, what 
what I mean by prompt is, supposing I had another path P, which goes here. To an, it's a different space-time point Q, Q prime. Remember that in my coordinates, this is X and this is T. You can forget about Y and Z for this discussion. And you see that this uh, path one, uh, let's call it gamma one and gamma two, although that's often used for geodesics, but anyway, uh, I shouldn't use confusing notation that conflicts with the literature. I think sometimes uh, L1 and L2 are used. Okay. So notice that the time, so this is the same space point, okay? And the time at which L2 reaches there is less than the time at which L1 reaches there, okay? This is um, obvious for anybody who has used space-time diagrams, but I find it well worth emphasizing because um, it's confusing. Sometimes we forget that a point, when we say a point, it's not a point, it's an event. It's not a place. It's a place and a time, okay? So whenever you see one path, one point directly below another, uh, you can either say it's in the past of that, or you can more favorably say that it occurs earlier, okay? So L2 is prompter than L1 because the goal, if the goal was to get from here to here, then L2 did it faster. And you can also see from this diagram that intuitively the slope of L2 will be smaller, okay, and closer to 45 degrees, which is an absolute bound. It can't go beyond that with, while remaining causal. And so L2 is prompter, so L1 is not prompt. So the point here is that L1 is not prompt if L2 exists. Okay, you can also slice things this way. You can say, well, at a particular time, that is along, say, this time, how are things going for the path L1 and L2? Well, L1 is here and it's still huffing and puffing and trying to get to my desired space point, but L2 has reached the finish line. Okay, so if you draw a constant time uh, surface, you see, that L2 being more prompt has reached the finish line and L1 isn't there yet. If you instead look at constant space, then you see that L2 got there first and L1 got there later. Either way, the definition, the terminology prompt is very clear. Prompt means uh, something that gets there sooner. That's basically the one line summary. Okay. Now, this definition is over all paths, not only geodesics. Okay. And uh, we can characterize prompt paths in some uh, examples relatively easily, and we can say a few words about them. Suppose there is a prompt path P, a prompt path from P to Q. Causal always is assumed from P to Q. Okay. Now, first of all, uh, so let's write causal anyway. First of all, just the fact that there's a causal path from P to Q means that Q must be lying in what we call J plus of P, the causal future of P. Okay, but that's true for any causal path, but also implies something stronger, uh, which is actually, that Q, and in fact, Q is in the boundary of J plus of P. And how do we see that it's in the boundary? Uh, we see that it's in the boundary from the fact that if it wasn't, then there would be a more prompt path. Okay, so let's try to exemplify, but again, I emphasize that it gets very confusing if you assume we are just talking about Minkowski and I'll tell you why in a, in a moment. So supposing Q was here, okay? And uh, 
if q was not on the boundary then a prompt causal path like this always has another uh, sorry a causal path like this always has another one shadowing it below which is more prompt below always means more prompt because below means ahead in space behind in time hmm? it's it's leading the way and it's a, therefore it's arriving earlier okay so then this is not prompt and you can see that the notion is topological because if i've drawn q to be well inside the light cone but literally wherever it is inside the light cone as long as it's not on the light cone there's always some point below it where the where another path can uh, go remaining causal and if there's a point below q this is the point q prime then my path p, p to q prime to q is a, or my path p to q prime is my more prompt path to the same space point okay so this doesn't work and therefore the only option in this simplified diagram of minkowski is that if p is here then q better be here which is uh, on the light cone but this statement, the light cone is a special thing. This fact that there's a straight light cone that's special to Minkowski. But this feature is very general because if Q is not uh, on in, in uh, boundary of J plus, then by definition, it's in the interior. And if it's in the interior, then there's always an open set which uh, encloses it. And in that open set, I can find a space-time point to which there's a more prompt path. I hope that's all clear. Uh, can I ask something? Hello. Please. Yeah. Uh, even in the previous case that you're describing where Q is in the interior of J plus P, I can always find a almost null path, right? Yes. Like I just yes. go along the light cone Absolutely. and then go Absolutely. along the other yes. direction yes. in the light. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, I mean, that is a prompt path, right? Which one? If I just go along the light cone. Yeah, that's certainly more prompt. It's as prompt. So the, the no, the statement here is a slightly different one. The statement is that if there is a prompt, so the problem is that if I do this and this, uh, I'm actually saying go beyond and then come back at forty five degrees. Uh, come like back at 40 keep going at forty five degrees yes, and yes. then take a five yes, minutes. yes. So Good. that. That's Good, thank you. everywhere thank you. almost. Okay. So let me check my statement. Uh, you're saying that since that path is prompt, that path can be prompt even though Q is in the interior of J plus. Yeah, it's an almost, I mean, at, at least the, uh, the ah, okay. time is bounded from below. Okay. Good, good. I think good. So maybe I missed a word or two here. Uh, Maybe you don't want null paths or something. I, I'm not no, sure. No, no, I don't. I definitely do want null paths. What I might be talking about are uh, geodesics. So let me just see. Mm. Prompt causal path from P to Q only exists if it is just possible to reach Q from P by a causal path. Uh, duh. Then almost by definition, a prompt causal path can only exist. Hmm. So you're saying that this null path, yeah, this is a, I'm a little bit puzzled. This thing. Yeah, that has zero uh, proper time roughly. So there is a path below, sorry, there is a point below Q that intersects the... Ah, uh, so yes. So that, that is not a prompt path, yeah. Uh, there's a point below Q. So the, so this path reaches the point at which Q, the space point of Q uh, earlier. Okay, that's so far, that's so, so good. But this isn't a path from P to Q to the space-time point Q. But what he's saying is that this is a path from space-time point P. Ah, good, good. I think that's the point that this path, though it's from P to Q, uh, it's it's this path actually reaches there earlier, the space point. It doesn't have to reach Q. So this is, I think now I understood it. You see, in the definition of prompt, I say that a path from P to Q is prompt 
if uh, or is not prompt if there's another path from p to q prime so the other path doesn't have to be from p to q hmm? and in fact in my notes i think i did something more useful which i could have done here let's do the following uh, let's see in my notes how i note here um, so let's see uh, let p let's try p1 and p2 so p1 is x1 p1 p2 is x2 this is useful because we really need to distinguish the x from the t now in this discussion so now i'll change my definition to be from p1 to p2 and so it is from p1 to p2 then p2 is in j plus of p1 and in fact p2 is in boundary of j plus of p1 so here's p1 and here's p2 and my claim is p2 must be here so let's look at this first case this path is definitely not prompt because this path gets to x2 earlier okay the statement now is that uh, it's called prompt if there is no other causal path that reaches x2 the spatial location of q at an earlier time okay so a path from p1 to p2 to test for promptness we should not find any other path that reaches x2 earlier by that definition this is not prompt because this other path reaches x2 earlier but even this is not prompt okay it's a null geodesic all right but it's not prompt because there's another path this one that reaches x2 uh, before this one which you are defining like that okay of course this much of it is even more prompt than the previous one okay but also it doesn't reach p2 and so for a path from p1 to p2 to be prompt p2 must lie on the boundary but i think uh, we can break this statement into saying that there is always a point where on the uh, boundary that is uh, del j plus where you have to stop and then go straight up basically so you don't have to go straight up the point is that your goal here is not to so we are comparing paths from p1 to p2 two space time events with another path that from p1 to the same spatial location as p2 we are not comparing two different paths from p1 to p2 this i want to emphasize no but uh, in in this case if we say that you know instead of taking points we just say that these are just points in space and not in time mm -hmm. and then we deal with that case say uh, p1 to p2 but these are space spatial points then uh, we can argue that uh, those spatial point i mean the space time point of when p, uh, when a, when anything reaches from p1 to p2 that will lie on the boundary uh, maybe i'm just making things more yeah yeah i mean i think it's a restatement of the same thing if i understand yeah. it right so the statement of promptness as i said the statement of promptness is that there's no other path that gets there first okay but the but the origin compared to the original path which gets there at a particular time you see the, the space time is so important here because after all what is a null geodesic or a null path or a causal path it's a path in space time it's not a path from one point to another okay but we are saying that the space time path would fail to be prompt if there's another path which reaches at a different time but the same space point so promptness is defined with respect to the final space point where you want to reach yeah okay but it's a promptness of the original path this is what is confusing the original path is not being asked to reach that point it's being asked to reach the space time point not the space point the competing path which will be which will 
make the original path non prompt is a point is a path to the same space point but reaching earlier and now you see that any path for, for p2 where i have shown it in the interior any path from p1 to p2 necessarily has a path in fact many paths that reach the same space point as p2 much earlier or even a little earlier so that makes it non prompt while if the point p2 is on the boundary then of course there isn't anything that reaches earlier okay now by the way this is drawn for minkowski but i want to emphasize that even if p2 is on the boundary it doesn't mean that any path from null path a causal path from p1 to p2 is prompt this is the problem this is why it's very subtle and we have to study this a little bit and i'll be i'll give you a few theorems about prompt paths and then i'll stop okay uh, note also this is very important point and this is why we get misled if we keep using minkowski in this example note that in minkowski there is a unique um null geodesic from p to every q on the light cone which means it's in del j plus of p since so there's a unique null and it's just it's nothing it's just the straight line along the light cone okay and it's prompt therefore it's prompt they are all prompt so promptness as discussed in minkowski space time is a completely silly notion because there's nothing else it can be except prompt okay their destination is on the light cone of my starting point and i draw the straight line between the two and i go at the speed of light and i'm there and nobody can beat me and that's it okay now why should we think that everything will not be prompt in a generic space time is actually requires a lot of intuition to understand that but actually there's a interesting uh, physics example given by witten which actually really blew my mind when i thought about it in this mathematical language think of gravitational lensing okay and think of it as a uh, freely propagating particle from some distant galaxy light i mean not particle freely prop propagating photon from some photons from some distant galaxy to us which are bent in the gravitational field of various stuff on the way and some come around this side some come around that side you have all probably seen this gravitational lensing phenomenon and literally all don't reach us at the same time and here it, it this couldn't have happened in minkowski space time if everything was minkowski then that galaxy uh, would just be a point uh, you know point or whatever its extent and every light ray from it would reach us in a straight null ray from there to here and that's that okay but the fact that in gravitational lensing different paths don't reach us at the same time is mind blowing because they are all null okay at every instant they are null because they are just free they are freely propagating photons in a metric of space time okay. you can say in a gravitational field but that is the same as metric of space time so you can just forget about the stars or anything on the way and you can just say that is propagating through the metric of space time and uh, they are not really bending they are geodesics they are always null what they are doing is doing the straightest thing at every instant that they can do because that's what einstein equation tells them to do okay and yet they don't all reach at the same time and therefore the ones which are earliest are prompt and the ones which come later are not prompt so there is such a thing as non prompt null geodesics so that's very important fact gravitational lensing implies there exist non prompt null geodesics but these uh, but, yeah prompt geodesics they have to be um, a light ray right anything that is Prompt or prompt. Null, no, no, null. Yeah, of course, prompt geodesic, uh, prompt 
prompt has to be a light ray and non prompt also uh, in in this case see pro yeah prompt has to be a light ray is that your question yeah that's my question yeah so it prompt depends has on to the direction in mm -hmm. which the, the the light is emitted from the distant galaxy sorry what about it mm. It depends on the initial direction in which the light is emitted. It's coming from the same. Yeah. It's coming from the same space-time point. Yes. But but the two light rays have different directions in which they are emitted. That's but fine. The, the final point is the same yes. because of the lensing. Yes. That's correct. All correct. The final space point is the same, namely my telescope on Earth. Yeah. But the final space-time point is not the same because one of them reaches before the other. Okay. Some of them reach before others. So that depends only on the... Uh, they, they reach at different times because uh, the direction of... The initial direction in which the light is emitted is different. If the direction were the same, then they would follow the same path. No, it's exactly. very, okay. Okay, that's fine. That's not a problem. Yeah. But the fact remains that they all follow null geodesics. Yes. Is the only but thing different, that we are interested uh, in. We are trying to trace null geodesics. Okay. And in spite of having been emitted at some other in some other direction, see already these statements other direction uses lot of uh, intuition. Of course, if you were on that star, yes, light is emitted in all directions. Okay. Now, all the photons are going out and they're all following null geodesics wherever they happen to find themselves. And from the point of view of a local observer at any space-time point, they're going exactly straight at the speed of light along the light cone of that observer. Okay. But space-time has curvature in the large. So, after propagating over a long distance, those geodesics have gone here and there, but still they are geodesics, still they are null, still they are just following straight lines in a very complicated geometry. It's entirely the fault of the Riemann tensor of that geometry that they are doing any bending or whatever. So, they are just following geodesics of that manifold. And since that manifold is space-time, we have no other thing to compare with and say that they were less straight or more straight. But what we can do is say that, well, we are here and uh, they are reaching us, some earlier, some later. So therefore, some are prompt and some aren't. So the difference in Minkowski is that if there were two, two light rays emitted from the same space-time point mm. and they were emitted in different directions, they would never meet again. That's right. And therefore, one of them wouldn't reach us. So the only wouldn't ones which would yeah. reach us are the ones which are pointed straight at us. Yeah. Okay. Exactly right. And they would be prompt because, in fact, there'd be a unique path. You see, that's the beauty of it. The entire path is a path from that star to us in completely flat Minkowski space-time is unique. It just goes straight till it reaches us. And the fact that it's just going straight at the speed of light uh, tells us when it will reach us. There's nothing to do. It's just the calculation of speed of light. It's distance traveled over time. So the time can be calculated from knowing speed of light and distance traveled. Now, all these things become more complicated in the curved space-time. And what makes it worse is that the invariant time, the only thing you can calculate, which is a property of um, the space-time itself is just zero for everybody because they're all null. So you can't argue that one of these prompt or non-prompt has less or more uh, invariant time. They all take the same invariant time, namely no time at all. But fact remains that some are more prompt. Okay, I've reached the end of my time and so I'll stop here. Um, uh, one exercise I want to assign to this very smart audience, please help me figure out where this promptness uh, originated in the literature. I mean, Witten's explanation is beautiful, but uh, it must surely be buried in, in some equivalent words in Penrose and Hawking's work. And I haven't yet been able, it's just me. I mean, I'm, I'll probably be able to find it out uh, in a few days. Hmm? 
Uh, and second exercise is please, please post your comments or questions and or questions on the website because it has suddenly, that website has suddenly dropped out of anybody's listing and is very nice for other students and even future students who may watch the videos to see your questions there. That's not to say don't ask in class, of course you should, but also please occasionally post something there. Hmm? Okay, so now we meet on Saturday. Uh, 4 p.m. Uh, I hope ICTS will send a mail, um, uh, Omkar or somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you, you want us to send a mail to everyone about the Please do. Please uh, do. Saturday class timing, right? Yes. If it can be also added to your website for the course, and I'll add it to the blog for the course. Uh, along with the notes updated. Uh, all right, uh, I'll uh, I'll let the IT people just to make sure nobody misses it. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye.